Welcome, Dr. Brian Curtis on location at the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show 2022. And we're at the Triple Paleontology booth. And I am with the legendary Tracy Ford, artist extraordinaire, paleontologist unbelievable. The man is an icon and a legend, and I happen to run into him today. So we are all fortunate. And we are here with the most complete ever discovered skull of Tyrannosaurus Rex. Is it the largest? No. But is it the most complete? Yes, every bone is represented and it's veritably uncrushed. But we're gonna let Tracy tell us about T-Rex because I'm a sauropod guy. What do I know? I'm gonna go over some of the, the, the holes in the head so you know where things are. This right here is where the eye would be. This is the orbit. People think this is where the nose is. It's not where the nose is. This is the nose. Now research has shown that instead of the nose hole being here, it's actually down here. I'm a big proponent about theropods not having lips. I'm going to explain why. The lower jaw will fit inside the upper jaw so that the teeth and the upper jaw would hang down below the lower jaw. In some specimens, that tooth will actually extend below the lower jaw. So if it had lips, it would have bit all the way through it. <laughs> now, one of the ways that we know how far the jaw can close is called the echoterygoid, this little bone here. What this does is stops the upper jaw from closing. If so it didn't have that, chances are when it closed its jaw, it would bite through the top of its uh, mouth. Now these little bones, these little holes in the bone are um, foramina. Now my theory, there's lots of them. I mean, there is lots of foramen on here. There's foramen up on the nasal, there's foramen on the premaxilla, and there's foramen on the dentary. Now some people think that is for the lips. So they say the lips would come down here like a lizard, or they'd come up here. But I say no, because the way the lower jaw fits into the upper jaw, this lower jaw would have to have about that much gap for these teeth to fit into. And there is no way to have that uh, lip structure <laughs> enough to stay open. So it would have bit right yeah. again. It would have bit right no. through. But my theory and some other theories is this is like an alligator. Now the alligator has a lot of holes in the, in, the, in the head. But that's for nerves. So it actually feel things. That's how they feel this pressure in the water, movement. Uh, when they start biting animals, they close their eyes so they actually feel the animal. So I say, and some others, that this is actually for feeling as it ate. Oh. Wow, and it makes, I can completely see that. Yeah, you wouldn't have these jowls, these bulldog-like yeah. Jabba the Hut jaws flapping in the breeze. It wouldn't have happened. And biting down, it, those teeth are amazing. They would have ripped right through, just yeah. the power it has on its own. Another thing is because the lower jaw does fit in here, about this much of the lower jaw is going to be about this much of the skull. So the, the lips would actually have to start down here. <laughs> if it had lips, because it's going inside the lower jaw. Inside the skull. And there's, uh, at least on this specimen, I don't see any nutrient foramina that far back no. up in there. Like no. it's clearly well developed up in the front of the face. Right. So talk to me about heterodonty on these tyrannosaurids, where the teeth up front, the premaxillary teeth, are a different shape effectively than you've got the killer bananas. Do you know much about that? Because I have a T hypothesis. Tyrannosaurus teeth are distinctive. And the premaxillary teeth are what they call D-shaped. To find a D-shaped tooth, you know, it's a tyrannosaurid of some sort. And they found them all the way back down to the early Jurassic in England. But they've also found them in the Morrison Formation. And I am one of the, I am the first person to identify a Tyrannosaur tooth in the Morrison Formation. <laughs> because of the D-shaped tooth. So D-shaped teeth up front, Tyrannosaur. The majority of Tyrannosaur teeth are thinner 
They're about like this, blade shape. So it changes from that. They, they, I've heard they think that this might have been for scraping. I, that's what I was going to say. One of the hypotheses I've heard is that you use these to scrape, to get the extra bit of nutrients right off that bone. And possibly, another one I like, to pick up their young because of these little tiny teeth in comparison with this super sensitive snout, maybe it was gently like a kitty cat moving its young around if it needed to. I really don't think a baby T-Rex needed to worry about much, but it's an interesting thought. It's a pretty thought. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so the rest of the T-Rex teeth, they're much larger and rounder. A lot of people call them banana shape. I don't like using banana because bananas are soft. <laughs> railroad spikes. All right, I'll go with that. Hard, big railroad spikes. T-Rex had the largest bite force of any animal because the, the muscle, the lower jaw, would wrap around here to here and here. They go in through here up to here. But you can also see all this area is all open. All of that is also for the muscle of the lower jaw. <laughs> so these guys are crushing. And I've read some engineering analyses that suggest the shape plus the ultra deep root would help disseminate that massive bite power so as to not shatter the tooth. The shape is designed when they crunch down because you'll find shattered teeth on animals occasionally and you almost never, you'll find hints of it, you'll find where the, where the enamels crack, but they're not blown up and dusty. Now, I was asked by uh, the other day, they said it alternated, small, big, small, but I said that I don't think it alternates so much as dumb luck. I, I've never seen a true alternating pattern. I think that this is just kind of illusory because this one, it goes small, big, small, little bigger, but big, yeah. back and forth. But they replace their teeth throughout their lives. Right. Another thing that people say about why they think it had lips is the teeth would dry out. Teeth aren't going to dry out. They're not in the skull long enough. And one of the argu an argument that I'm starting to use now is alligators. Because there's avistation, which is like hibernation, but it's during the summer. So there's crocodiles in Africa and other places where they'll dig a burrow, stay in the burrow during the hard season for months. No, no water, no nothing. Dry burrow. And their teeth aren't cracking, aren't breaking up. That's a great example. What, one of the great things about paleo is using modern animals to interpret the past. We can put our hands on it and they're around today and we can go check it. I love it. Binocular vision. Yes. I'm staring at this, excuse me, the camera work, and it is looking right back at me. That's terrifying. Wow. Unbelievable. This thing's like just like a Pac-Man because its arms are small. What was it doing with its arms? Don't know. But if you look at the arms of T-Rex and compare it to other Tarnosaurus, it's actually larger. Like Tarbosaurus, I was looking at yesterday at the Arizona Museum of Natural History. It's smaller than my arm. Yeah. It was incredibly it's tiny. Smaller than T-Rex. So T-Rex's arms weren't, weren't getting smaller. Another thing is the claws. The claws are pointed. They're sharp. They were used for something. The claws and the feet are pointed. So they, they talk about the teeth. You gotta worry about the claws. <laughs> Well, one thought I have with, I used to wonder if maybe it did push-ups. It would squat down on its pubic boot, and then it's getting old and creaky and would push itself off the ground. But the more I've looked at how this thing would bite into something, it could use those meat hook claws to help steer it and extra hold on. But why does it have to have one function? It could do many things. And if I'm going to kick over an ankylosaur id and try to avoid those shin spikes, those claws kick it over and I could rip the heck out of something too. It's just a big beast. It's like Big Bird angry. Another thing is this big empty space is an antorbital finestra. Now people, and I used to do this too, we would draw an illustration of the antorbital finestra. We have an indentation up here. And I used to do that too. Well, I was looking at some modern specimens, and this area, not a modern specimen, but uh, an actual specimen, this area is smooth. 
inside is smooth. This right here on the surface is rough. So something was going on here. So now I'm thinking, you're not going to see this finestra. This skin is going to go here to here. You're not going to see it. Was that a large pneumatic carrick, like an air sac here? What Could was... be, because... Because whenever I see smooth... Right here, it goes from the nose, along here, and there. But there was something going on. Because in the sauropods, whenever I see smooth, it's always air sac. It's, there's always some kind of diverticulum entry point, smooth it out. But I've never studied any of the skulls, and the sauropod skulls, they're, you know, different. Yeah. <laughs> they're not as awesome as this. And I hate to say it because I love sauropods. But it's this... Funny, but they, they never draw this part indented. It's always smooth. Yes, always yeah. smooth. Incredible. So when you're looking at this animal, what, what attached this head to the cervicals? Let's look at the occipital condyle. I mean, look at the size of the bone structure. I mean, that's sin was, so the cervical vertebra. Now on ceratopsians, they had those sin cervicals, those few cervicals, but these guys didn't fuse them. So they still had some mobility and range. Yeah. Incredible, I mean, just. And also the position of this will let you know how the head was held. So most Tronosaurus is like this. In T-Rex, it's like this. So the head was actually held at an angle. So peering and, down? And if you look at the narrowest point, is right here. So with the head down, you've got your binocular vision, you've got a clear... How fast was it? Because you are, some argue slow, some say it's speedy. Where do you fall in the, in the continuum of speed? I follow, I, I, I do what Tom Holt says, you just got to be faster than your prey. That's <laughs> fast enough. Fast enough. <laughs> I love it. Tom's a great guy. Not a scavenger. No. Not a scavenger. Now, I like to tell folks, and correct me if you think I'm wrong here, akin to a lion today. It hunts, does what it wants, yeah. but if it happens to see some hyenas that tick down something that it just happens to want to eat, it just walks over and shoes them away. Yeah. And So it's scavenged, but not in the sense of it waited in rotting bodies for days on end. It, it ate what it wanted when it wanted. Right. Yeah, yeah, I, I have no problem with that. That's amazing. Yeah. So what else would you like to tell us about our friend Tyrannosaurus Rex. Tracy Ford did the original artwork for Fossil Crates, our very first crate. Here's the guy that drew the artwork. I went and found him, I've known him forever, but like Tracy, would you be the honors? And he did, so thank you. You're in our Hall of Fame. So anything else you want to tell us about T-Rex that comes to mind? The floor is yours. Um, some scientists, Curry and Horner, think that there might've been a caracnus or horny covering. Because when you look at this, like, this is nice and bumpy. I'm not too sure about that. There is a specimen at uh, the Royal Trail Museum where this is actually smooth. Oh. There's no bumps on it. Wow. Okay. Amazing. Well, Tracy, thank you so much. This has been such a You're pleasure. Welcome. It's been fun. All right. Well, thank you all kindly, and we'll talk to you soon. Adios.